Okay, so a couple of key things. We're gonna sort of be going back and forth right now between the Neo-Malthusians and the Cornucopians, which is the other side. Um, and so we'll go through several different examples, but again, keeping in mind the big picture. What do these two camps sort of argue and what types of evidence do they use to support their case? Lots of different examples of things you could pop into that iPad equation. Um, conceptually, right? We don't actually quantify that. So we'll, we'll do that. And then we're going to look also at a few examples of the T in IPAT, how technology can lessen, mitigate our impact on the environment. It can also make it worse, depending on how it's used. Okay, so recall Thomas Malthus. We've been talking about him. He was a British economist that wrote this famous essay, an essay on the first principle of population in 1978, over 200 years ago. In 1978, when Malthus was writing this, the global population was around 900 million. Um, today, we're past the 7 billion mark. And this way of thinking, his, his ideas, are still very influential today in science and policy circles, and it has spawned what we refer to as a neo-Malthusian framework or the depletionist. So the neo-Malthusians, if you will, carry on Malthus's ideas. Again, Malthus specifically said, population, if unchecked, grows geometric or exponentially. He assumed fertility rate was around four or six, excuse me, four children would actually make it to reproductive age. However, food increases arithmetically or linearly only, and ultimately land is finite. Obviously, Malthus was writing this uh, before several advances in food production and technology. So there's some problems with what he said. It's not actually accurate. Um, nonetheless, this type of thinking, this theory still underlies policy today. Um, so food increases only linearly and ultimately we live on a finite planet. Um, here is illustrating this relationship. So carrying capacity, food, resources, limiting factors in nature, like food, resources, stay constant in nature or grow arithmetically. When the carrying capacity is reached, limiting factors in populations begin to take place. Population cannot exceed carrying capacity without ramification. And so as populations grow towards carrying capacity, eventually they will outstrip available resources. And it is at this point, once population rises above carrying capacity, that you get Malthusian catastrophe. All these checks, he calls them, set in on the population to bring it back down below carrying capacity. Things like war. Uh, disease. And if all else fails, famine will eventually set in to bring the population back down. Malthus identified a couple of different types of checks, uh, negative and positive. And they're confusing in terms of semantics. Negative meaning you're not adding anything to the system. You're not adding to the population. So negative preventative checks are things that lower the fertility, the birth rate marrying late, having children later and less of them, um, abstinence or birth control were all proposed by Malthus as ways to deal with this. It's worth noting that Malthus favored moral restraint, uh, late marriage or abstinence, for example. However, he only proposed this for the poor and working classes. So there's negative checks, reduce the birth rate, and also positive checks, positive meaning you're adding something to the system. Uh, to reduce population size by increasing mortality. Disease, as people become malnourished, unhealthy, war, fighting over resources, disasters, and eventually famine will set in as a check. And so he said uh, famine would occur at this point, he called, called overshoot. Once the population overshoots the carrying capacity, checks will set in and the population will crash until it's back below carrying capacity. And so his thinking is still relevant today and carried on by the Neo-Malthusians. One example of Neo-Malthusian thought, Club of Rome, it's a group of scientists, industrialists, and economists from different countries, and they wrote this book, The Limits to Growth, sort of carrying on Malthus' ideas. And what they said, they modeled all these different factors. They looked 
Yeah, population, food production, resource depletion, and pollution. And so they basically modeled these different scenarios in a world where growth continues, at what point is overshoot going to occur? Two of the scenarios resulted in a crash or die off. Um, we didn't make it. And a third resulted in a sustainable sort of future. The basic conclusions, what the Club of Rome said, if present world population growth trends continue and associated industrialization, pollution, food production, and resource depletion continue unchanged, the limits to growth on this planet will be reached sometime in the next 100 years. And really, that was 50 years ago. Um, they'd say the most probable result is a sudden uncontrollable decline in both population and industrial capacity. So basically, as growth continues, sustainability is becoming more and more unattainable. And one of the most popular, uh, popular most prominent neo-Malthusians is this biologist, Paul Ehrlich. Him and his wife wrote this book in the late 60s, The Population Bomb. And it essentially warned of the population explosion, overpopulation is going to happen. It's already happening. Um, we're running out of resources. And basically, there's no way out at this point. We're already too far gone. Um, sort of alarmist, but it brought, it brought the awareness of the environment and population um, to a wider audience. And so his book starts with this quote, um, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s and 80s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. At this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in world death rate. Um, and, and so he basically said it's already too late. This type of thinking, Paul Ehrlich, the population bomb, his wife also wrote the book, but she's uncredited, 60s. Some of the solutions that Paul Ehrlich suggested so if you think population is the problem, you'll focus your solution in there. Um, in, in answering the question, what needs to be done, let me give you just a few examples of what he proposed. Uh, he said, we must rapidly bring the world population under control, reducing the growth rate to zero, even making it negative. Conscious regulation must be achieved. Ideas on how to do this, he thought the United States should take a leading role. Um, one, because you know, to control our own population, but really so that we had the moral high ground to stand on to tell other countries what they should be doing. Uh, Ehrlich floats the idea of adding temporary sterilants to the water supply in the U.S. and staple foods that we all eat. So add sterilants um, unknowingly to the rest of us that would sterilize us. Um, talks about tax schemes, that people have more than a certain number of children. You tax them, you charge them for that. He also talked about adding a luxury tax on child goods. So like if you need to buy food for your baby or diapers or something like that, there's a tax added on to make it really expensive to disincentivize people from having um, kids. And he also was supported uh, sterilizing people in India without sort of either without telling them or providing them a financial incentive, especially if they've already had one or two kids. Um, so if this is how you understand the problem, that's sort of the solutions that you're going to come up with. This thinking isn't new. Ehrlich is not an innovator. This goes back to Malthus, and it has been official U.S. policy, as you saw in the Legacy of Malthus film, for decades. Right? Your U.S. tax dollars go towards funding these population control programs. Uh, again, the book was sort of criticized. It was a bit alarmist and it didn't come true necessarily, right? We're still here. So the predictions didn't actually come true. Again, it did achieve the goal of raising awareness about environmental degradation and, and human impacts, humans role in that. So Malthus, the Neo-Malthusians, the Club of Rome, are they right? Uh, let's look at some evidence for and against their ideas. Esther Bozera is a Danish economist, and you read about her in the Malakoff article that talks about Machakos, Kenya. And so th this economist, this is what the other side, the other camp, um, the Cornucopians, oops, 
Cornucopians, in contrast to the Neo-Malthusians, they often cite Bozerup to support their point of view. She was an economist. She was looking at agrarian change, farming under population pressure. So as population grows, what happens with people's farming? How, what do they do? And what she said and what she found is that she argues, she turned Malthus on his head. She basically said, that it is not carrying capacity. It's not food supply that determines how many people you can have. So what Malthus said, it's not that, it's the other way around. How many people you have, your population size and density, that will determine your food production methods and your carrying capacity. So she said, people themselves are resources. We have minds um, and we can innovate and come up with new technology. And necessity is the mother of invention. Thus, as populations grow towards carrying capacity, they'll innovate, they'll develop a new technology, they'll use land more productively, they'll tap into different resource bases and innovate their way into expanding carrying capacity. This school of thought, this sort of camp, in contrast to the Neo-Malthusians, these folks are the cornucopians or the boomsters. So sort of the cornucopians, the boomsters versus Neo-Malthusians and the doomsters. And it's sort of, does anyone know what a cornucopia is? Does anyone know what a cornucopia is? It's from Greek mythology. You probably all drew a picture, a stupid picture of one around Thanksgiving if you grew up in this country. Um, it's this horn that magically supplies its owners with food and drink and whatever else they want. And it just magically fills up. Um, so the cornucopians sort of believe that earth will be able to provide for us indefinitely and they even talk about well if we run out of you know matter and energy on earth there's always space that we can exploit for its resources too um, so they sort of believe indefinite growth is possible <clears throat> and so bows are up this are the cornucopians they'd say demographic pressure population density as that increases as there's more people and it puts pressure on the resource base People innovate, it promotes innovation, leading people to using the land more productively. They start irrigating it, they start weeding it, they start intensifying their methods, using different seeds, using different tools, and pull more crops out of the land. So this, under Bozerup, this is what the relationship between population and resources looks like. So you can see population every time it nears carrying capacity, you see carrying capacity go up, this sort of vertical line, which symbolizes a change, an innovation that has allowed us to expand carrying capacity. So we'll actually never reach it. Uh, we'll continue to innovate and expand it. And this has already happened. We've already done this with the industrial revolution, the use of fossil fuels. Um, the green revolution, this introduction of fertilizer and hybrid seed allowing us to grow enormous yields compared to what we used to be able to grow on the same acre of land. And so we've, and in the future, who knows, with genetically modified organisms, the use of corn, which we'll get into in a week or two, um, we've already done it and we can do it again. Humans can expand carrying capacity. So this, one of the studies that you read about that illustrates Bozerup's argument comes from Machakos, Kenya. And the study shows that overpopulation is not necessarily a catastrophe and that larger populations can actually even bring benefits, right? Um, so the study was done over several years from 1993. I'm not gonna ask you about these details, but just for context, um, scientists from London and also Nairobi and they looked at changes in the population and the environment over the 60 year period from 1930 to 1990. And they also looked at other changes, um, new economic policies, new technologies, new farming techniques. So really holistic. They looked at soil fertility, household finances, um, to the effects of colonialism, um, anything they could get their hands on. So what they found is that it, within this period, population roughly quadrupled. It grew enormously. But also within this 60 year period, the environment actually got restored, um, less eroded, less deforested. Um, the soil became more fertile. The hillsides became revegetated. And not only did environmental outcomes improve, 
Um, social outcomes improved too. Livelihoods were improved. Income um, standards of living went up. Uh, and so just looking at the photos, if you look uh, at the hill on the top, that's 1937. That's prior to these changes that they're looking at. Uh, here's just a close up sort of of that same picture. Um, so largely deforested. One key thing that is pointed out, when you have a lot less people, um, people tend to extensify, they tend to spread out and use this plot and this plot. Um, when you have more people, you can't, there's not enough land to just spread out. But one of the results sometimes is that people then intensify their efforts in that area and actually turn, make that land more productive. Um, so this is 1937. Uh, and then this is 1991. This hillside has been transformed through terracing into this productive wood farm. And so people started planting fruit and coffee and different timber species. And you can see the terracing on the hillside. That takes people to do. That requires lots of labor to transform the landscape in this way. It's ended up reducing erosion as more vegetation covers the soil. It keeps it from being eroded away. It puts valuable nutrients back into the soil, increasing the fertility. And it's overall more productive. Just another example on the left, this is a goalie, 1937. And basically the goalie was created from agricultural runoff, a little bit of water running off that created that goalie. Uh, this is the same goalie on the right in 1990. It's a little bit wider, but it's revegetated, right? Which helps prevent erosion. If you also look at the top of the hill in both pictures, you can see heavily deforested on the left, largely revegetated on the right. And so the overall results of the study, population grew rapidly during this time, but population growth was actually surpassed by increased uh, productivity and increases in income. So it need not mean catastrophe. Um, it depends on the particular circumstance. There was also other factors that were important um, that I won't ask you about, but New investments of work and capital. The government supported land tenure, for example, so that people that had access to land were given tenure. You then have a reason to put work and investment into that, knowing that you'll get a return on that. Um, many of these changes, terracing the landscape, uh, creating the wood farm, it requires people. You can't do this with a minimal amount of people. You need larger, denser populations for the labor power to actually do this. Plus the markets to buy the different products people are producing for their livelihood. It gets at this idea of underpopulation versus optimum population. And so the Machaco study shows that underpopulation can actually be a barrier to development, right? Sometimes you need more people to actually do some of this stuff. And don't worry, if anything I didn't mention, don't worry about it. But the point is it it's, it's requires multiple factors coming together. It's not sort of a one size fits all solution. Another assumption about the Machaco study is I just showed you the deforested hillside and the revegetated terraced hillside. The study assumes that replacing the natural landscape with sustainable farming doesn't equal environmental degradation. And not everyone would agree, um, especially sort of deep ecologists. They'd say the natural environment's inherently more resilient. And when you modify it for human use, you're, you're creating problems. Um, and so that's sort of an assumption. Not everyone would agree that creating sustainable farming is necessarily environmental restoration. So Machaco seems to be escaping the Malthusian dilemma. Um, not every region is. And so the quote, the trick is getting good policy that addresses local conditions and recognizes the needs and knowledge of local people, right? You have to understand the context. What do the people actually need or want? You, a lot of times in development projects, outsiders come in and implement a project. They don't even talk to the beneficiaries of that project. So what do people actually need? What do they actually want? Um, it can be done, right? It's about getting good policy and actually understanding the local circumstances. 
So was Bozer up right then? Um, and indeed, we have and probably will again expand carrying capacity. But does this solve all of our problems? Even if we can keep expanding carrying capacity, finding resources to subsist or consume, what about resource degradation and pollution? Um, can we continue to innovate our way out of these issues as well? And in the 70s through the 90s, uh, so looking at the ongoing debate between the Neo-Malthusians, Cornucopians, in the 1960s, new fears started to pop up uh, in the public awareness. This is the time of Rachel Carson writing Silent Spring about DDT killing wildlife, um, pesticides, starting to see some of the effects of the changes we've made, right, through technology, through the chemicals we're using in farming. And so new fears start to arise in terms of the environment's ability to absorb and neutralize our growing waste stream, um, especially some of these toxic chemicals. Um, the cornucopians would retort that, no, we'll, we'll innovate our way out of this as well. So the people that sort of argue on this side, the cornucopians, they're mostly economists right? Not ecologists or biologists or anthropologists, mostly economists familiar with Bozerup's work. They focus on certain things rather than others. They look at prices on the market. Um, they focus on human inventiveness, ingenuity, and also technological innovation. So sort of cornucopians would say as as, as, as resources become scarce, basic sort of laws of supply and demand, if, if a resource is becoming more scarce but still in demand, the price goes up, right? You can charge more for it. Uh, and so if you look, the price of resources globally has declined, the cornucopians would argue. They'd say the price actually continues to go down uh, and arguing that resources are becoming not less available, but more available because of one of the most prominent cornucopians is Julian Simon. He co-wrote that book, um, Pro you know, Progress, Things Are Getting Better All the Time. He co-wrote it with the top financial advisor for the Trump campaign in 2016. So, and I mentioned what these people do, where they come from, because these ideas don't exist in a vacuum, right? And so Julian Simon said, Malthus is wrong. Um, populations increase at all types of rates throughout human history. Food production, and this is true, has increased at least as fast, if not faster. There's no discernible trend towards higher resource prices. It's the opposite. The only thing that's gotten more expensive is human wages. We're getting paid more, depending on where you fall in society, right? So let's kind of take a look at this. Um, this argument between scarcity and the price of resources. Are, there, are, are we running out or will we never run out? So October 2nd, this is the LA Times, 2004, oil price per barrel hit a milestone high, 50 bucks a barrel. Uh, uh, this was a threat to the economy, the G7, the wealthy countries around the world, called on oil producers to pump as much as possible to help bring prices down. So the idea being, hey, make more oil available, more supply, uh, drive the price down. By 2008, um, oil prices hit a record of almost $150. The cornucopians would say, this too shall pass. You'll see the price go back down. Um, Julian Simon's book, The Ultimate Resource, Natural Resources, Pollution, World's Food Supply, Pressure of Population Growth. Every trend in material human welfare has been improving and promises to continue to do so indefinitely. This is the cornucopians. This is a chapter from Julian Simon's book. Um, and there's some teeth to what he's saying. So the chapter, when will we run out of oil? Never. These are different uh, predictions of how much reserve, how much we have left. 1865, Stanley Jevons in his book, uh, growth of England's industry must soon grind to a halt due to the end of coal. No reasonable prospect of relief in the future. 1885, 20 years later, U.S. Geological Survey, little or no chance for oil in California. 1891, U.S. Geological Survey, same prophecy for Kansas and Texas. 1914, 
U.S. Bureau of Mines, total future oil production limit of 5.7 billion barrels, about 10 years left. Almost 30 years later, 1939, we got about 13 years left. 1951, reserves to last 13 years. And so people have been saying that we're going to run out for a long time. But the truth is that we haven't, right? And one reason for that is that, again, as we near carrying capacity or prices get expensive, people often innovate. They develop new technologies that allow us to either more efficiently extract those resources to make it worthwhile or switch to new lower grade resources that were previously inaccessible. Let me get into what I mean. Um, so they've been wrong. They've been saying we're going to run out and it hasn't happened. Um, and if we look at more recent events, it looks like it really might never happen. So you read about uh, this concept, peak oil, in the Atlantic article, and Bodley talks about it. So peak oil is this point in time when the maximum rate of petroleum, oil, fossil fuels, extraction has been reached. And after this peak oil point, the rate of production is expected to enter terminal decline. Okay, so peak oil was proposed by a prominent geophysicist at Shell Oil at the time, M. King Hubbard in 1956. Peak oil, essentially, um, when, when companies extract fossil fuels oil, they go in and grab the easy, cheap stuff first, the stuff that we kind of envision lying in these big pools in the Middle East. And as they pull more and more of that oil out, it gets progressively difficult to tap into. You have to dig deeper, it's more difficult, it takes more effort and cost to get the same amount out. And so peak oil is this point in time where we'll have extracted so much that production will enter this terminal decline because extraction methods have gotten so difficult, so costly, because we've already pulled so much out, that it's no longer really worth the cost um, for what you're getting back. You can't make your money back on what you're pulling out um, because it's just become too costly to tap deeper and deeper into these wells, peak oil. And so this new technology being developed, it's not quite ready yet. It, the hydraulic fracking of methane hydrate, basically pulling methane out of this frozen in the ice in the seafloor. Um, they're developing a technology to do this right now and this development of methane hydrate has basically debunked Hubbard's peak oil. Um, it's never going to happen. We're never going to hit that point because as resources become depleted or expensive to extract, people innovate. They develop a new technology or switch to another resource. And so methane hydrate is kind of another feather in Simon's hat. It supports what the cornucopians are saying that we really never will run out. And importantly, in our IPAT equation, um, that T, technology, plays a role in overall human impact on the environment. It can help mitigate, lessen human impact on the environment. For example, developing green technology, solar or something like that, reduces carbon emissions, stop contributing to global warming, mitigate our impact. The T, the technology, it can also exacerbate, make worse humans' impact on the environment. Um, methane hydrate, and we'll talk more about this, is an example of, of that. It could make things better. Um, it could make things worse. And so this, this would essentially free us from dependency on Middle Eastern oil, but not without some consequences. The article you read, What If We Never Run Out of Oil by Charles C. Mann, um, a new technology and a little known energy source suggests that fossil fuels may not be finite. This would be a miracle and a nightmare. And so Charles C. Mann, he's a journalist, writes on scientific topics. Um, again, we, the, the technology is a few years out, but it's just a matter of time before it's ready. And it's going to allow us to tap into enormous fossil fuel reserves that previously weren't accessible. Let me give you just some background on fracking and what we're talking about uh, before we dig into that. Fracking or hydraulic fracturing, it's a technique. You see the picture on the bottom uh, for shooting high pressured water mixed with sand and other sediment into the earth's sediments. You shoot this water with sediment in it. 
um, the little pieces of sand hold open the cracks in that sediment, allowing methane that was previously trapped in there uh, to, to be released, to come up to the surface. So you shoot water and sediment down, pry open all these cracks in the earth's sediment deep underground, um, and then pipe that methane up to the surface, natural gas, methane. Uh, you then you light on fire to, to make sure that's what's coming out. Environmental concerns around fracking, uh, twofold that I'll touch on. One is groundwater contamination. So you're shooting all this water with chemicals and other particles in it down in literally into our ground and groundwater. There's no sort of regulation surrounding this. Um, this is why a lot of communities don't want fracking in their backyard, right? Um, environmental degradation, toxic pollution in their water table. And just real quick about Rex Tillerson, former CEO of, of um, ExxonMobil oil company, um, who by the way, in like 2014, got a $30 million bonus for bringing in profits for Exxon. It's one year, $30 million bonus. He became secretary of state in 2016. Um, now he's back to the private sector. And it's a good example of when Bodley says, why, do, why, are, why are we seeing such maladaptive behavior, policies and activities that are literally degrading the planet we all depend on for survival? Uh, and Bodley says, because our elite decision makers have all the power and they often make decisions in their own interest, not in our interest. And so Rex Tillerson is pro-fracking. Go for it. Frack the shit out of it. And, but not on my ranch. And he has a ranch in Texas and he, I'm not sure if the case is ongoing or resolved, but he went to the high court uh, in Texas, like the Supreme Court of the state, to basically prevent a fracking operation from occurring near his land in Texas. So Rex Tillerson, pro-fracking, promotes it, does it on other people's land, but don't do it on my ranch. And he went to the Supreme Court to keep these companies away from his land. Okay, so that's fracking. Oh, and the other environmental concern with fracking is methane release. Burning natural gas, methane, burns much cleaner than burning coal or oil. So it could be a useful energy source to help us reduce CO2 emissions while we work towards a more green solution if that's how we use it. Um, it burns cleaner, but when you're extracting the methane from the fracking, a lot of it leaks and no one's really required to monitor that. Methane traps like 20 to 30 times the amount of solar radiation that CO2 does, that a molecule of CO2 does. So it's a much more powerful greenhouse gas. And so if there's methane leaking out during these fracking operations, this is a major concern in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, further climate change. Okay, so fracking, petroleum is a grab bag term for non-solid hydrocarbon resources. You say gas or oil, people are in other places of the world say petrol. Natural gas refers to methane, a colorless odorless gas that has the same chemical makeup no matter where it's taken from. So ordinary petroleum, well or methane hydrate out of the ocean. And it was only recently discovered that you can extract methane hydrate from the seafloor. Um, it requires really cold temperatures, and it was previously thought only to exist in space, actually. And so methane hydrate then is a solid compound, uh, ice, in which a large amount of methane is trapped within the crystalline structure of water, um, forming a solid similar to ice. So the picture of what it looks like is here on the right on the slide, sort of this ice lattice. One cubic foot of this ice, this methane hydrate, uh, contain, one cubic foot contains 180 cubic feet of methane. So this stuff is packed with natural gas. It forms is kind of similar to how methane gets trapped in permafrost. You have, um, Organic, organic material, organisms, plants, animals, as they die, they sink down to the bottom of the seafloor, form several feet deep. And there's microorganisms that feed off this dead organic remains. Mm. And as these microorganisms eat and grow, they emit methane. So then on the seafloor, um, you have these microorganisms emitting methane as they eat and grow off this decomposed plant matter. 
And the methane bubbles up through the sediments. Remember, several feet deep of this decomposing material. The methane bubbles up, but it very quickly encounters cold water at these deep depths. And so it, it reacts. Methane and water react to form this crystal, crystalline structure, this lattice you see here on the slide. And it creates this ice structure that traps the methane gas inside of it. Uh, and then to extract it, you pipe it up to the surface, light it on fire to prove that it exists. And so hydraulic fracking is different from normal fracking in the sense that you're, we're doing it in the sea versus in a terrestrial environment. So this use, this technology is not ready yet. Um, it represents a shift from a, to a new resource type via a new technology from conventional to unconventional petroleum. Conventional petroleum is what we all think of, these sort of pools of oil lying in the Middle East that traditional oil well method is how we extract it. Unconventional is everything else. And it's called unconventional simply because in the past, these technologies um, or using methane hydrate, it was too hard to pull from the earth to be worth the effort. Um, too expensive, too difficult, not efficient. You can't get your money back on it. Now, innovations in technology has made many of these resources accessible. And so carrying capacity in general, how many resources we have, is always dependent on current level of technology, right? And as we innovate and develop new technologies, we can tap into previously inaccessible resources. So this development of methane hydrate, it's kind of supports what the cornucopians have been saying. When are we going to run out? Um, never. And if you look at reserve estimates, the yellow dots is where methane hydrate is. We know it exists. Um, the blue is where we think it exists. And the reserve estimates anywhere from 100 times the U.S.'s annual energy budget to 3 million times the U.S.'s annual energy budget. So with just methane hydrate, um, we could run, let's just say the US for another 100 to 3 million years off just methane hydrate. Um, the reserves are enormous, enormous. Um, just real quick, Japan is dependent on foreign oil. So they have a vested interest in developing their own fossil fuel resources. So they're not dependent on foreign countries. Um, and so they've been researching this quite a bit. And at the time the article was written a few years ago, they said the technology is about 10 years out. They sent out this research ship to harvest economically useful amounts of, of methane gas. Um, they ended the trip early. They collected like 4 million cubic feet of methane hydrate at double the expected rate. Um, so it's gonna become economically viable. It's really just a matter of time. And it makes Hubbard's point on peak oil sort of a moot point, meaning um, irrelevant. We're never gonna hit peak oil because we keep innovating new technology. We keep switching resource bases based off that technology. We keep expanding care, carrying capacity. We're really literally not gonna run out. And so it supports Simon and the cornucopians to an extent. When will we run out of fossil fuels? Um, never, quite possibly, not in our lifetimes. Is that the most important question for our survival? Let's suppose for a moment resources were infinite. And that's not <laughs> how I tend to view the world. But let's just say, given we keep shifting technology or shifting our resource base, um, we can continue to consume almost indefinitely. And that's what's happened so far. What is being overlooked? What is not addressed? So we can, we'll never run out. Um, we'll always create new technology or switch resource bases. We'll never run out. Is that the only thing that matters for our survival? What else is overlooked? What else matters in the bigger picture? What's overlooked? For one, unequal access to resources. Yeah, our health. Good, that kind of, with pollution. So just because 
we can continue consuming. We're not going to run out. That doesn't mean everyone has equal access to that. There are so many people on this planet, billions of them, that don't have access to the basic necessities for survival, right? For a decent standard of living. Um, and there's enough, right? The evidence suggests there is enough stuff. It is not equally distributed. People do not have access. Um, pollution, right? Increasing levels of waste, toxins, pollution. Our soils are contaminated. The air, increasing greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, all being driven by increased consumption because we literally aren't running out of resources. Right? This is where our pollution goes. We export it to other places around the world. And one other thing, key, is by using methane hydrate, once it's ready, it's still a few years out, it might forestall a shift to cleaner renewable energy sources. It sort of disincentivizes people from developing green energy. Because why would we? We have all this methane hydrate that's right here. It's cheap and easy for me to use. I don't want to spend a bunch of money and cut into my profit margins and develop solar or something else. Uh, I'm not saying that. And so despite infinite petroleum not running out in our lifetime, um, using methane hydrate might forestall a switch to actually green energy, to non-CO2 emitting energy. Um, the idea is that we could use it as a bridge fuel to sort of carry it for a decade or two. Methane hydrate, natural gas, burns way cleaner than oil or coal. So from a climate change perspective, it's a much better choice. We would be emitting much less CO2, um, less climate change. The problem is that it's not, it's not so much the burning of natural gas, um, but any of the methane that leaks from the well where it's being extracted has a huge potential to cause climate change. So again, each molecule of methane has like 20 to 30 times the capacity to trap and re-radiate solar heat uh, relative to CO2. And the rule of thumb, rule of thumb, missing the thumb, is if the well, the fracking well, leaks more than 3% of the methane being pulled out, then natural gas actually becomes dirtier than coal from a climate change perspective. So it's not the burning of it, but it's all the leaking in the sloppy extraction of it. Um, that actually will make it worse than using oil or coal from a climate change perspective. And uh, there's no one's required to regulate this. There was a study done in Boston of like 800 miles of roads uh, or of infrastructure along the roads. And there was like 3,300 leaks. So our infrastructure is aging and riddled with holes. No one's required to actually monitor it and make sure it's not leaking. Um, so it has to be used right. And then also having access to this could undermine the rationale for investing in carbon free energy. Uh, Man talks about it being used as a crutch, a bridge fuel, sort of use it. It burns cleaner than oil and coal. Use it for a decade or two. In the meantime, while we're doing that, also be developing more green technology, non CO2 emitting technology, sort of carry us over until we can switch. Um, but only if we use it as a bridge fuel and given the way our elites make decisions, um, not likely. And ultimately, even if we can continue to supply resources to fuel ever rising consumption, uh, the deteriorating effects on this planet on our life support system are becoming ever more undeniable. Man interviews this professor of economics at MIT, and he, so he says, um, it, methane hydrate, could help the world while we reduce greenhouse gases, or it could undermine the economic rationale for investing in renewable carbon-free energy around the world. Uh, the one path is a boon, the other I've used words like catastrophe, and I wouldn't bet on us making the right decisions. And so IPAT, the T, it can help lessen our impact on the environment. For example, using methane hydrate as a bridge fuel. It burns cleaner than coal and gas, oil. And then while we're doing that, we can develop even greener technology. It could help lessen human impact on the environment. On the flip side, technology, depending on how it's used, can also exacerbate and make human impact on the environment worse. And so in this case, using methane hydrate, fracking it, 
continuing to use fossil fuels uh, can, could allow people to go doing on just that, right? Why switch? Why invest in green energy when I already have a cheap available source, fuel source, right? Especially for those that are sort of in charge and running the company. Um, so it can be one or the other. It depends on how it's used. Um, this is just one short little example to wrap up our Neo-Malthusians versus the Cornucopians. Um, who's right? And the answer is both of them and no one. And so the Club of Rome made these predictions. Uh, Paul Ehrlich, the population bomb, he said the world's going to run out in this book. The world will run out of gold by 1981, mercury by 85, tin by 87, zinc by 90, Petroleum by 1992, not there yet. Uh, copper, lead, and natural gas, even though we just talked about methane hydrate, in 1993. Uh, did it come true? And remember, sort of, uh, the Neo-Malthusians, resource scarcity, too many people, cornucopians, um, will innovate. And that's what the cornucopians would say. Um, as the price goes up of natural resources, we improve our extraction methods. We improve our efficiency. We switch over to lower grade resources. We switch from oil to methane hydrate. The key resource is human ingenuity. Um, human minds matter. And so as prices go up, people don't wanna pay high prices, they'll innovate. Figure out a better way to extract that resource or fill that need, bring prices back down. And Simon would say this benefits all of us, right? Trickle down. Um, people, Simon says, are the most important thing. Minds matter, innovation matters. Okay, so Simon and Ehrlich made a bet. The bet was that, and sort of Simon, they, they fight, right? Academics fight might not be the right word, but they debate. And so in response to Ehrlich's population bomb, Simon said, uh, wrote, you know, resources, population, environment, an oversupply of bad news, sort of retorting to the Neo-Malthusian, saying you're wrong. And so the bet was, uh, Simon bet that the price inflation adjusted for any set of raw materials would be lower in 10 years than it was at this time, 1980. Uh, Ehrlich and his people took up the bet. And so in 19, and so the idea is if the price goes down in 10 years, resources are becoming more available, according to the cornucopians. Mind you, that still doesn't deal with the environmental aspects, the social inequality. If the prices go up, that would sort of support Ehrlich, right? Becoming less available, therefore prices go up. So they picked five, Ehrlich picked five resources, five metals, chrome, crop, copper, nickel, ton, tin, and tungsten. And he bought $200 of each for a total of $1,000. So if prices go up, Ehrlich, what sort of supporting them, Simon has to pay them the difference. If prices go down, Ehrlich has to pay Simon. And so in this 10 years from 1980 to 1990, we saw the biggest increase in world population ever by almost a billion people. And without a single exception, the price of every single resource declined, sometimes significantly. Um, 10, the price was down by 72%. And so Simon won, here's a picture of the actual check that he mailed to, uh, that. Paul Ehrlich had to mail to Julian Simon. So he had bought $1,000 worth of these metals. And 10 years later, that $1,000, the price 10 years later was only about 425 bucks. Sort of supports uh, Simon. If you recalculate this bet, this is The Economist 2011, um, recalculate the original bet, wait 10 more years, like double or nothing, then Ehrlich would have won. Um, the prices went back up. Cornucopians would say, oh no, that's just increased demand in the developing countries. Prices will come back down. Uh, the Neo-Malthusians would say, well, in the long term, prices have gone up, right? So uh, sort of the debate is ongoing. And one thing I'd like, the last thing I want to highlight for you here is the way people understand the problem is going to influence the solutions they are able to see and choose. And so we have a continuum here. On the one hand, sort of ecocentric, deep ecologists, the Neo-Malthusians. Um, they think rapid population growth and increased development have led us to a place where there's not enough resources and there's too much waste and pollution and too many people. On the other side of the spectrum, the cornucopians, um, champion the ability of technology and humans to innovate 
to develop and adapt, uh, to come up with solutions to the problems that might arise from population growth, uh, consumption, and waste. And so depending on how you view the problem or what's causing our problems, it's gonna influence your solution. So just something to think about is how would population management strategies vary between these two extreme perspectives? The way you frame the problem is gonna influence the solution. If you're not correctly understanding it, what's the use in the solution or the answer anyways? What is a bigger threat? to social and ecological sustainability. Resource scarcity, not enough stuff, or overconsumption. 